The damn right apprentices. Life was tough in the late 90s. That was, if you were middle class, lived in a mundane town. You did quite well at school, and yet friends and admirers could be found. The odds were stacked against you, except they never were, at least in Nathan's world. But most important of all was the music. Join the indie rock band Upton Speak and their plight through celebrity-obsessed times. See how in a sea of political correctness the mediocre pale against them. Or is it green? Whatever it was, they seemed barely aware of themselves anyway. That was a blurb of a book that I released on Kindle last year. I think it was in July or the first version. Here's the cover. Can't really see that all that well. This long novella or short novel. Bit of a bad glare, but that actually isn't the cover I chose, uh, which appears on Amazon. Uh, for some reason, you can't get rid of the original one because, uh, which I wanted to do, because it says bass, as in in the picture, picture of the amplifier there. But um, I might will in fact read your excerpt buy it on kindle folks very few people seem to be but they don't know what they're missing it's very reasonably priced at three pounds 81 not because it's poor quality but because i want so many people to uh, enjoy it june 1996 he was emerging now from the climax his body's temperature cooling from its recent rise while the room's paint-scented and, and urbane air dimmed the phosphorescence of his face. Through the libido of youthful ignorance and joy, they were the docile harbingers of cod authority. It is true that all who were present were prefects, but these were the less socially well-equipped boys. The twain never met with the mysterious and unstructured real world which lay outside of this stage of their lives. By some mere accidents of irony, perhaps, the best never realised what they lacked, and Nathan, not even the best of this crop, was reclining in the art room with an unquestioned insouciance. The freedom made him giddy, and there was always someone laughing heartily, stood by the next table. Taking a break, he ambled over to where the intense, yet effectively here, very harmless exchange was taking place. Another laugh, contagious and spreading, like the freedom of unquellable grief. This was the greatest means of a self-supporting world, a genteel regional malehood on a small small scale. A scale reduced only by the immediacy of a sun bobbing between privets, blossom and conifer. Whereas Nathan overgeneralized this existence to the world as a whole, there are others who struggle to reconcile even this naivety with fiction. Pretty nerdy, underachievers and nonetheless talented, it was those of us who would damn well exercise their right to project their inadequacies onto others. Jermaine, or Geronimo, and Robert were the finest culprits. It was paid for by the state combined with the generosity of private benefactors. Percy's mother had donated the kettle. This in a country and a school which tended to lack subsidy for the chronically perplexed, but only the school was visible to our boy. Mr. Jocksnap, ooh, the minx. It was ushering in a new era of openness and harmony. For some reason, this was a strain against previous cumulative social products in Britain's dynamism. They would laugh together. The subjects of their amusement were the imagined depraved. The more depraved to inexperienced minds, the better. To detract ever further from who they were, through the ironic ostracizing of pretend or unlikely people, the very better. Their minds were made of a gingery down, soft and yet preoccupied with satirical intent. Nathan's was the softest of, and indeed, with, it could be seen, all. His peer's ginger was merely an adolescent thin stripe, which would fade as they reached a gothic cynicism of their origins. The fates of those others would be to exhibit it less than the beta maleship that his school winds of grades and form captaincy had begun to extort from society, Nathan never knew words like extort back then. Could it have been true that Nathan was an alpha? Surely in terms of biology, the others would have to be less. So swept the brush of near oblivion. Uh, 
And here's another excerpt about uh, a drummer with the strangest name, the strangest name of Sved. That's S V E D, Sved. And I have this prop to be of such great interest to everyone uh, on that theme. And another one in a minute. I was trying to upload a picture then, uh, upload a picture, uh, but I can't, so I'll just show this as another prop. It's Bongo from Africa, which I've had for at least 22 years, I think. Maybe the start of this. Uh, from a family friend from South Africa. Anyway. Read you another excerpt. Very good, then, um, Jeff. Uh, that was not the correct thing for a teacher to say, to get a student's name wrong, and not for the first time. With minimal humility, his weapon, paleontology teacher Charlie K. Crabb was almost correcting himself before the said youth. At least on this occasion, he was listening to the answer. And it was an answer from someone else. It hurt to listen, though, for someone like him, especially with the onset of age. Not least his problem was that he was delivering a syllabus of anthropaleontology, all human skeletons, and, and heaven forbid, he was having to teach and learn human history. On the question of his surname and numerous other matters, he had heard the jokes and he had heard the jokes, and another scientific technocrat who everyone seemed to want to listen to for two years, everyone in that small class clearly did, from their self-interestedly provincial northwestern English middle-class homes. They never uttered the word Philistine, that was the job of the one to be struck down. Theirs was merely to toy with wind-ups for socially normal strategy and their eventual intake into burgeoning bureaucracy. Sved, the teenager, replied nonchalantly. Now that was unusual, but Charlie Kay did not spare the foil and soon responded. Of course it is, Sved. He paused before repeating his student's name, adding emphasis to his chummy intent. Sved's real name was Stuart Vernon Davis. He played drums and had ash blonde curly hair. He had a puffed out face, a casual countenance, and quite unfazable, often far away eyes. The fact that his chosen acronymic name sounded like a shortened version of an STD combined with VD was of no importance. Sved was rarely late. Sved tended to hand in work that was average to above and in on time, and Sved could keep a beat. During the following lunch break, Nathan had briefly chatted to an acquaintance called Melart, who he had met at secondary school. Nathan had described his largely fruitless attempts at guitar playing, but in spite of that, his enthusiasm for the, for the, for the pursuit of mastering the instrument was undiminished. Melart's response was one of oblivious demand. He insisted that Nathan could improve to a seemingly unattainable extent, and that playing guitar could never be too hard. Even the fact that the lecturer in question had a duff third finger did not dull Mellart's own intransigent and irrational enthusiasm. It was, of course, deceitful and tinged with schadenfreude, whether or not Mellart realised it. Nathan had an inkling that it was not a fair cop. So there it is. Oh, isn't it getting darker? Um, so there you go, uh, the moral is, uh, stay away from drugs, work hard at school, kids, have fun, and, uh, never a dull moment, never a dull moment at all, is it? Oh, what's eating me?